All right, so good evening, everyone. Um, so today, we're going to start our study of the book of Zephaniah. All right, so we'll start our study of the book of Zephaniah. Zephaniah is... Uh, is a book of the Bible. It's, it's probably very, very famous or well known as the least known book of the Bible. <laughs> uh, it's, it's strange. What? Obadiah. I even know, but I'm even more, a bit more familiar with, uh, about Obadiah than Zephaniah. At least there's a popular quote from Obadiah. I said, Savior shall come up from Mount Zion, something like that. You know, so I, I, I always think of Obadiah. All right. And funny enough, there is a popular book I know from Zephaniah in chapter three. I just didn't even, I didn't even know that's where it was from. You know, so Zephaniah is probably, probably, uh, at least it's a, it ranks as one of the least known, least uh, visited, least talked about, or probably least read book of the Bible. And, uh, it's a part of a collection of, I think, 12 books of the Old Testament called the Minor Prophets. And uh, I, I don't like that term, Minor Prophets, uh, because for me, my own thinking is that, you know, in, in local parlance, it is the message that God sends somebody that the person will go. I mean, it's whatever word God gives a man that the man will relate to us. It's whatever task, rather, let me put it that way, whatever task. A to Z that God gives you, that you're going to do. If God had given people like Obadiah and Zephaniah the workload of the Jeremiah, I'm very sure they would have done it, right? So, but then it is what it is. And uh, I think it was Augustine that that tagged them major and minor prophets and it's stuck ever since. You know, so, but I, I don't like the term, but then, so it's, he's regarded as a minor prophet. Um, sorry, I even forgot to share my screen. I uh, move my screen along. Okay, there we go. All right. Um, all right, so it's regarded as a minor prophet. Um, so a little bit about the historical background and setting of Zephaniah. Uh, firstly, the book was written, was most likely written between the years uh, 640 BC and 609 BC, uh, about the same time when uh, the city of Marseille in France you know, was founded, right? Same time. And, um, and if we know a little bit of Bible history, we would know that um, as, as at this time, over a century earlier, over a hundred years earlier, the Northern uh, Kingdom of Israel, the 10 tribes, Northern 10 tribes had been captured uh, and their capital overrun by the Assyrians, the Samaria, you know, and they had been carried off into, into uh, captivity, into slavery, uh, you know, in 721 BCD, all right, 721 BC. And uh, Zephaniah, right out of the bat, he gives us an inkling of when yeah, he ministered. He ministered during the reign of King Josiah. King Josiah was the last godly king of Judah before the exile. All right. Uh, I think there were a couple of others, including Zedekiah, that was born on the throne when the exile happened. But uh, uh, Josiah is uh, remembered as the last godly king before the exile. All right. And um, Josiah, King Josiah himself, is worth mentioning because he's uh, he he um, he was he sought the Lord from a young age. He became king at age eight, and I think at age sixteen he began to seek the Lord you know, or, or thereabout, and then he established, he went about some reforms trying to uh, turn Israel, you know, back to the worship of the one true God and away from all the many idols that they had found themselves chasing all over the place, uh, which, by the way, his grandfather Manasseh and his father Ammon had plunged the country into for about 57 years. All right, so Josiah tried to, to upturn that, but I, I, I wouldn't say he was very successful. One moment, please. Uh, let me see if I can do The spirit would come on them for that act. Now we're seeing something very different that is part of something greater that is happening. And 
Uh, hello, I can hear someone. Someone saying something. Please mute yourself if you're not speaking. Thank you. All right. So uh, one more uh, fun fact. The prophet Zephaniah, uh, his name, his name, uh, his name means uh, a one whom the Lord has hidden, or the Lord has hidden. You know, and scholars are trying to guess that perhaps he was born during the reign of the wicked king Manasseh, and uh, for some reason his family thought it best to hide him. All right, from Manasseh, especially because of another fact that uh, Zephaniah shares with us right out of the bat in verse one, where he says, uh, verse one, uh, we can start. I'm reading from the ESV. Uh, I'll just uh, speak about verse one and then someone read the whole chapter for us before we dive in. So, verse one uh, is introduction, is all the introduction we get in the book of Zephaniah. It says, The word of the Lord that came to Zephaniah, the son of Hushi, son of Gedaliah, son of Amariah, son of Hezekiah, in the days of Josiah, the son of Ammon, king of Judah. All right, so what, what this tells us here is that uh, probably that was why his family had to hide him. He was probably born during Manasseh's time, and he was born to the royal family of King Hezekiah. All right, so uh, he's, this automatically makes Zephaniah uh, the, probably the only prophet with royal blood. All right, he was born to the royal family. And then this also tells us something a bit about Zephaniah and his ministry in the sense that uh, it means that Zephaniah would have been, had a vantage position to observe what was going on, not just in Israel and in Judah as a whole, but in the palace. Would have had access to young King Josiah, would have known what the Israeli, uh, the Judah elite people were doing. And we're going to see that reflected in how he denounces them. Right, he, he would have seen all their their sins and corruption firsthand. All right, so uh, there is that. Then one more fact I missed is that the prophet Zephaniah, because of the timing where he, when he lived and ministered, would have been a contemporary of the prophet Jeremiah, and probably the prophets Nahum and Habakkuk. All right, so um, somebody, I think somebody online should read for us because it will come out more clearly in the recording. Uh, let me see who's here who can read for us. Dave, can you read for us from verse 2 to the end? Zephaniah chapter 1. Bro, Dave. Okay, uh, if Bro Dave is not there, Bro Moroti. Uh, for Hillary, for Shola, anybody who can start reading first, please help us out. Zephaniah chapter 1, verses 2 to the end. I will utterly sweep away everything from the face of the earth, declares the Lord. I will sweep away man and beast. I will sweep away the birds of the heavens and the fish of the sea and the rubble with the wicked. I will cut off mankind from the face of the earth, declares the Lord. I will stretch out my hand against Judah and against all the inhabitants of Jerusalem. I will cut off from this place the remnants of Baal and the, and the name of the idolatrous priests along with the priests, those who bow down on the roofs to the host of the heavens, those who bow down and sweat to the Lord and yet swear by, by Milcom. Those who have turned back from following the Lord, who do not seek the Lord or inquire of him. Be silent before the Lord, for the day of the Lord is near, and the Lord has prepared a sacrifice and consecrated his guests. On the day of the Lord's sacrifice, I will punish the officials and the king's, and king's sons and, and all who array themselves in foreign attire. On that day, I will punish everyone who leaps over the threshold and those who fill their master's house with violence and fraud. On that day, declares the Lord, a cry will be heard from the fish gates, a wail from the second quarter, and a loud crash from the hills. Wail, O inhabitants of the mortar, for all the traders are no more. All who weigh out silver are cut off. At that time, I will search Jerusalem with lambs, and I will punish the men who are complacent. Those who stay in their hearts, the Lord will not do good, nor will he do ill. Their, their goods shall be plundered, and their house laid waste. 
Though they build houses, they shall not inhabit them. Though they plant vineyards, they shall not drink wine from them. The great day of the Lord is near, near and hastening fast. The sound of the day of the Lord is bitter. The mighty man cries aloud there. A day of wrath is that day, a day of distress and anguish, a day of ruin and devastation, a day of darkness and gloom, a day of clouds and thick darkness, a day of trumpet blast and battle cry against the fortified cities and against the lofty battlements. I will bring distress on mankind so that they shall walk like the blind because they have sinned against the Lord. Their blood shall be poured out like dust and their flesh like dung. Neither their silver nor their gold shall be able to deliver them on the day of the wrath of the Lord. In the fire of his jealousy, all the earth shall be consumed for a full and sudden end. He will make of, he will make of all the inhabitants of the earth I think is it is just verse, verse uh, chapter one, right? It's yes, just chapter one. Thank you very much. May the Lord bless the reading of His Word. Amen. So, um, okay. So here, uh, Zephaniah, um, Zephaniah jumps right into his message, and apparently it's a gloomy one. And yeah, he says in verses two and three, "I will utterly sweep away everything from the face of the earth," declares the Lord. I will sweep away both man and beast. I will sweep away the birds of the heavens and the fish of the sea and the rubble with the wicked. I will cut off mankind from the face of the earth. Declares the Lord. All right. So um, other than what is obvious here, you know, if you look closely, you're going to see like uh, a few buzzwords that should take our minds back to Genesis one and two. All right, where God, out of chaos, is bringing order to the world. He's creating life. He's bringing light. He's creating animals, man and beast. He create, creates human beings, uh, men and women. He creates uh, the man and the woman. He creates all kinds of animals in the sea, the birds of the heavens, the fish in the sea, the animals crawling on the floor, you know. And here Zephaniah is, is hitting us straight up with uh, something that suggests or clearly points to a reversal, a twist of creation. You know, so God is... God is, uh, in his wrath, is promising here a twist, a reversal of creation, all right? And this is, on, this is he's saying, I will cut up mankind from the face of the earth. I will take out everybody out of play. I'll take everybody out of play, all right? So here, Zephaniah is, 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 is prophesying from the Lord uh, a terrifying reversal of creation, a removal of orderliness, a complete desolation of the whole world, all right, you know, absolute destruction and chaos, all right. So God is practically going to undo creation as it has now been contaminated by sin and rebellion, all right. So, but it's, and, and, and as you see here, it's not just the animals and the earth itself. He says specifically, in case you missed it, I will cut off mankind from the face of the earth, declares the Lord. You know, so um, for me, it's a startling, uh, it's not a good way to start a book. If I were to advise Zephaniah when he's writing his book, you, you want to start off easy, you want to start off smooth uh, and, and build your case. But right from verse 2, after introducing himself to us in verse 1, Zephaniah tells us that God is, uh, because of sin, he's threatening the worldwide uh, uh, global destruction. All right, so perhaps this is uh, uh, one reason why the book of Zephaniah is not a favorite read in today's feel good culture. You know, we're hell bent on, on things that give us pleasure, things that are easy, things that are comfortable. And even in the things we read, the movies we watch, we, we, we want to stay away from anything, quote unquote, stressful, anything that suggests uh, danger or fear or pain or loss. You know, but Zephaniah is giving us, giving it to us. Uh, um, just as it is, and uh, it's not a good way to start a book, but this is the truth of God's word. All right, so um, I'd like to say that um, much as this book is somewhat unpopular, that we should consider that it is scripture, it's God's word. So just like all the other scriptures, both the ones we, especially the ones we like, it is also profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, you know, so that we may be complete and lack nothing. Amen. 
All right, so, um, so here, Zephaniah first goes to the vault and tells us God's plans for the whole world. And then he then zooms in on Judah from verses four to six. He says, I will stretch out my hand against Judah and against all the inhabitants of Jerusalem. And I will cut off from this place the remnant of, uh, the re sorry, hold on, let me, from this place, the remnant of Baal and the name of the idolatrous priests and uh, uh, with the priests, along with the priests. You know, so here, uh, first off, it says, I will stretch out my hand. All right, that's a very common term used in scripture, used by the prophets, actually. For example, Isaiah 5, 25, I didn't pull this up, and we have quite a lot of scriptures to read. So maybe let me appoint, uh, rather than calling randomly, Roshola, please be on standby. Uh, or Hillary, who else is there? Rotam. Uh, so uh, as I'm reading out the scriptures, anyone of you who can open it first to read. All right, so Isaiah 5.25 should give us an example of where this, uh, this um, term is used, where God says, I, I will stretch out my hand. Isaiah 5.25, okay. Yeah, you can read. You can just maybe raise your voice. Oh, okay. Isaiah 5.25. This is going to Yes. Okay. Can, can I read? Can someone read? Can I read? Yeah. Okay. Isaiah 5.25. Therefore, the anger of the Lord was kindled against his hand. out his hand against them and struck them and the mountains quakes and the coppers right. and the, the copses. Okay. Yeah. Okay. I, I could barely I, I can barely hear you but I, I got the part where you said uh the Lord is going to stretch out his hand and strike them. You know so that's exactly what is going out here. It is usually used uh in in, uh, in a scenario where God is about to inflict judgment, is about to inflict pain or punishment on a people. And in this case, the verse tells us who the target is here. It says against Judah. All right, Judah is the southern kingdom of Israel that survived uh, Assyria's re um, the Assyrian uh, exile. And, and of course, whatever people survived from there would have joined the southern kingdom. All right, so here, uh, God is promising uh, judgment on Judah, this surviving Jewish kingdom. All right, and he says, I will cut off the remnant of Baal and the idolatrous priests. All right, so I, I think Baal is probably the most famous, uh, most famous pagan idol that the Israelites went after in the Bible, if I'm correct. All right, so here again, they had gone back to worshiping Baal. And for him to say the remnant of Baal, it means, uh, yeah, some scholars say this may indicate that Zephaniah was prophesying at this point uh, when uh, Josiah had maybe done or began his reforms. And, and God is saying, what is left of the bowels in the land, I am going to strike them off, I'm going to take them out. All right, and, um, and the prophets mentioned here, the idolatrous priests mentioned here, are the Shemarim, They're, they were the priests, they were the pagan priests, right? And I think the root word uh, described them as black faces, in the meaning that they, they have done so many sacrifices, uh, so many bond sacrifices to these idols, that they have, the suit had made their faces black, blacking their faces you know and, and that gave them the name all right so god is here saying he's 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 promising a catastrophe and he's giving us a list of the people that are on his hit list and it includes the whole of judah the remnants of the idols of baal and the idolatrous priests and then he mentions with the priests all right so scholars here say this is an uh, this is, uh, refers to uh jewish priests temple priests who had gone along with these guys to either allow for the idols to be worshipped and sacrificed to on the temple mounts or go to their high places to join them. All right, so in verse 5, it says, those who bow down, God continues to identify these people on his, on his hit list. And he says, those who bow down on the roofs to the host of heaven and those who bow down and swear to the Lord and yet uh, swear by Malcolm. All right, so first of all, those who bow down to the roofs and to the host of heavens well, would, would mean people, would either mean people who were uh, involved in a form of Baal worship or people who were directly worshiping the stars 
and the sun and the moon and all the heavenly bodies they could see from the, two, the, uh, from the roofs of their houses. All right, so here God says, uh, I have seen these people, these people are my hit list, and they are going to be judged uh, in the day when I come out to stretch my hand out against Judah. All right, and then he identifies another group. He says, also those who bow down and swear to the Lord. They come to the Lord, they swear to him, and yet they swear by Malcolm, by Milcom. All right, so Milcom is the, is the chief god of the Ammonites, or also by the name Molech. Right, I think uh, this god is very famous for a particular kind of a particularly grievous kind of sacrifice where they sacrifice little children to uh, they burn past little children into fire, you know, as a sacrifice to Molech. All right, um, it, it was it was a, a practice of the Ammonites and the Israelites, the Judea, the people of Judea at this time had gone back to this form of idolatry. And God is here saying, uh, there are, there's a certain group of people, they they're one leg in, one leg out. They come to the Lord, they swear by him, they pray to him, and at the same time, they swear by Mal Malcolm, you know. Uh, so this was a clear sign of, of, of uh, how, how bad things were at the time, where people, you know, religious pluralism, uh, where people are worshiping both God and idols at the same time. Uh, and um, these people, maybe they were, perhaps they were people who were, still in transit they were still on their way to abandoning the worship of the god of israel completely so at this point in time they were they were they were worshiping god and at the same time uh, they were already, already beginning to worship malcolm or perhaps um like solomon i'd like for someone to read for us fully because it captures first kings chapter 11 verses 5 to 7. Rosh Allah, you're there please First Kings chapter eleven, First Kings chapter eleven, verses five to eleven. First King eleven, five yes. to eleven. Five, oh, five to seven, sorry. Five to seven. Yes. For Solomon went after Ashtoreth and the goddess of the Sidonians, and after Malcolm the abomination of the Amorites. So Solomon did what was evil in the sight of the Lord and did not only follow the Lord as David his father had done. Then Solomon built a high place for Chemosh and Sorry, abomination. I need to stop at verse seven. Yes, I'm reading okay. verse seven now. Okay, finish it. Then Solomon built a high place for Chemosh, the abomination of Moab, and for Molech, the abomination of the Amorites, on the mountain of the East Jerusalem. Okay, thank you. Please uh, help me move to chapter 18, verse 21. I'll let you know when to read. All right, so here it tells us uh, the terrible things that King Solomon dabbled into, and how that is, is the, the key term I was looking for there was that. Solomon did not follow the Lord fully. Mm -hmm. Solomon did not follow the Lord wholeheartedly. Solomon did not follow the Lord uh, completely. While he was following the Lord, he was still uh, following other gods. And here, the Bible names some of them. It says one of them was the abomination of Moab and 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 Molech. And uh, you know, so uh, this pluralism, this uh, I think it's even syncretism, maybe. You know, where you're worshiping multiple gods, you're mixing and matching, right? Uh, it, it, it didn't start in the time of Josiah and Zephaniah. It's something that has been in Israel for a very, very long time, uh, long time, the time of Solomon, even unto the time of Elijah. As at the time of Elijah, in the northern uh, uh, kingdom of Israel, the ten tribes, the one they had that had, that had really risen to prominence was Baal, all right, under King Ahab. And Elijah said something which is God's mind, and it's very frustrating. And Elijah says something really key for us. Please read for us verse 21 of First Kings 18. Roshola. Okay. And Elijah came there to... So I can't hear you. ...people and said, how long will you... Sorry. Sorry, please read it again. Sorry, let me start again. Yes. yes, a call came in. And Elijah 
came near to all the people and said, how long will you go limping between two different opinions? If the... <laughs> all right, sorry, sorry. So basically, Elijah was saying, if the Lord is God, worship him, serve him, follow him, and only him. And if Baal is God, then follow him, leave the Lord. Don't uh, hover between the two, all right? So, and then we know the story. Elijah challenges them to, uh, uh, throws a challenge at them, which uh, they fail woefully to prove uh, their God's potency. And then, uh, and, and then from there, uh, that, that, that God comes, comes out later to consume the sacrifices, proving that he alone is God. All right, so, so, so basically that's the same frustration that had gone on for centuries, all right, right up to the time of people like Jeremiah, and Zephaniah and Nahum. People, it was it was an abomination, you know, to be worshiping God and at the same time, in fact, some, at, at times they even set up the, the high places or altars for these gods right in the temple, all right, right there in the temple. And the priests, the Levites, Levitical priests who were supposed to be dedicated to the Lord, you know, engaged in this pluralism, worshiping the Lord. When you want to sacrifice to the Lord, when you want to sacrifice to Moloch, like they are there to help you out. You know, so God is targeting these guys and saying, uh, he's listing these guys, that those who bow down to me and yet uh, go to Milcom, they are on my hit list, and they are the reason for this coming judgment. All right, so I, I think over in the New Testament, James chapter 1, verse 8, uh, James decries double-mindedness. He says that the double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. All right, and uh, in, in chapter 4, he says to purify your hearts, be double-minded. So from those times and up till now, uh, believers are called to worship the Lord only. Think about it. They, I think that was even the first commandment, Exodus 20. Uh, uh, you shall have no other God beside me. You know, they have broken the very, very first of the Cardinal Ten Commandments. All right. It, uh, so, and, and, and I believe it happens today, but maybe we'll get to it uh, because we have different forms of idolatry today. Where people serve the Lord and at the same time their hearts... Uh, are elsewhere. All right, so uh, he moves on to identify another group of people after this, and he says, those who have turned back from following the Lord, who do not seek the Lord or inquire of him. So in my mind, it's working like uh, the, the idolatry is still in progress, it's still in motion, where uh, the people in verse 5, they're still hovering between the Lord and idols, and then the people in verse 6, They've already progressed beyond. They've abandoned worshiping the Lord completely. And now they, they, they've turned back from following the Lord and they do not seek him or, or inquire of him. They do not seek his blessings anymore. You know, so um, according to Hebrews 10, this is, this is the opposite of faith. All right. And, and, uh, and, and, okay, maybe we should read that. I think I underlined this. Okay, so somebody please read for us Hebrews 10, 38. So that we will understand. Right, please speak into your mic so we can hear you. Hello. It says, the just shall live by faith. Uh, that's uh, a quote from Habakkuk, I think. It says, and if any man draws back, my soul will have no pleasure. Yeah. So this group of people, they are people who have turned back from following God altogether. Please mute yourself if you're not speaking. They've turned back altogether from following the Lord. And then uh, uh, the second part of verse 6 says something I find particularly interesting. It says, who do not seek the Lord or inquire of him. Other translations say, who do not seek the Lord's guidance or blessings anymore. All right. So, um, you know, we always think of sin, you know, uh, in terms of commission, in terms of do, rather than uh, in, uh, in terms of omission, things we're supposed to do that we do not do anymore, that we stop doing. All right, so here, uh, God is listing this sin of omission of people who have stopped 
coming to him with their prayers, with their petition, with their, uh, with their needs, with their requests for guidance, with their inquiries. And uh, this part had me remembering uh, a particular king, um, King Ahaziah, Second Kings 160, we don't need to go there, where uh, I think he, he fell from the roof of his palace and then he was uh, sick unto death. And then he sent people outside of Israel to go and inquire of some foreign God. And I think Elijah was the one who confronted him and said, See, you're going to die on that bed. Is it that there is no God in Israel for you to inquire from, you know, that you're going outside? You know, so, um, and, and also, it reads in my mind as these people have stopped worshiping God by coming to him with their petitions and by relying on him. So that tells us that um, our acts of worship to God, a key part of our acts of worship to God is our reliance upon him, is our dependence upon him and bringing our petitions to him and opening and pouring out our hearts to him rather than splitting it between him and, uh, and elsewhere or taking it elsewhere altogether. All right, so uh, this is one scene of omission that the people, this group of people had also committed. All right, so I think I already addressed this. All right, so okay, uh, as a question, anybody um, with any other ideas or any other sins of omission that are common to us today? We do not love our neighbors as ourselves. That's a good one. Yes, anybody online? What other sins of omission, you know, are common to us today? Yes. The whole of the body. Somebody needs to. Uh, Benga, please mute yourself. All right, so, okay, so Dick Wale said uh, one sin of omission that is common uh, today is the sin of not loving our neighbors as ourselves. Okay, okay, somebody has posted something. Let me see. Okay, Roshala says offering prayers to God on behalf of our government and leaders. Huh? We are obligated to, but we're not doing that. Okay. <laughs> Mr. Chinasa says, thank God for Jesus Christ. Well, thank God for him. All right. So, okay. So we'll just continue because of time. All right. So verses seven to nine. So it says here, um, be silent before the Lord God for the day of the Lord is near. The Lord has prepared a sacrifice and consecrated his guests. And on the day of the Lord's sacrifice, I will punish the officials and the king's sons and all who array themselves in foreign attire. On that day, I will punish everyone who leaps over the threshold and those who, for, who fill their master's house with violence and fraud. All right, so verse, verse 7 is here. What he's saying is not saying be silent, like as in keep quiet. It's, it's a stern way of saying hush, keep quiet. All right, it's like when you are in, in, in the court and, and the courtroom is noisy and the judge is about to come in and take his seat. You know the way they, they uh, uh, what's that, the gavel? <laughs> I was going to say hammer. You know, the, the way they hit the, ga the gavel to get everyone's attention and say hush, silence. You know, the judge is here. Uh, the court proceedings is about to begin. That's what's going on here. So God is approaching and he says uh, uh, to judge and he says he has prepared a sacrifice and consecrated his guests all right so um now of course we know that that zephaniah is using figurative speech here uh, in the sense that this is not uh you know like one of those banquets that jesus attended those wedding banquets where they, had, they invited him and there's plenty of food to go around and people are eating literal food and drink this is different so here uh god is talking about uh a sacrifice which we will see as we will see maybe i shouldn't jump the gun but the sacrifice here is figurative i'll come back to this all right so and he says on the day of the lord's sacrifice i will punish the officials and the king's sons and the king's sons and all who array themselves in foreign attire all right so first he says i will punish i remember i started out by saying that zephaniah was a member of the royal family of the large royal family so he he must have seen the way that these officials and king's sons, the princes and princesses and all of them in, uh, in the uh, king's court must have carried on and misled the people and influenced the people towards evil. 
all right? And, and here God is, uh, is, is, of course, showing that I've seen this and I will punish them on that day. And uh, there are a few scriptures for us to read here. Um, maybe, I, maybe I should just mention it, that um, this actually was fulfilled literally because when uh, Nebuchadnezzar conquered Jerusalem, uh, one of the, the groups of people that they were particular about killing and 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 uh, emasculating and making eunuchs that's the one that survived you know they were, were predominantly people of the king's court the king's children the way uh, i think it was zedekiah's children that were killed in front of his eyes you know so this was literally fulfilled all right and then god says something else here that that is weird i find it weird I, and I, I'm, I'm throwing the question here it says all who array themselves in foreign attire what could be wrong with jews dressing themselves up in foreign clothes? Was God being racist? Or was God, you know, like the Nigerian government, you know, buy, buy Nigerians to grow the Naira? <laughs> Why would God be offended at the Jews, especially the people in the King's Court, wearing foreign clothes? Anybody online? All right, so I'll, I'll just give you my take. All right. Um, so basically, uh, we, we know that God had anointed Israel, God had called the entire nation of Israel to be special to him, to be different, to be sanctified, to be separated unto him. Roshala, if you're there, can you please go to uh, help us read from Leviticus 19, verse 19? All right, so, so and, and God wanted them to not just be special and different spiritually and morally, but in fact, even in their very appearance, right? While the nations of uh, all the other surrounding nations were ones to adorn themselves with gold and deck themselves silly with gold and silver and the most expensive and outlandish, you know, uh, clothes, God wanted his people to be a lot simpler, you know, that by mere citing a Jew, by their dressing and simplicity, uh, you, you will be able to identify them just by seeing them. All right. Now, this is not does not mean that uh, uh, we cannot wear nice clothes. We cannot look good. But apparently, this was something excessive that they had imported. It was an excessive habit they had imported from uh, some scholars say from the Babylonians, for example. They were the reigning world power at the time, and their royal dressing was really elaborate. You know, someone could see you coming from a mile away. You know, so and the Jews here had copied this as well as copied their customs. And perhaps the dressing had something to do with their pagan customs and culture, and these people had copied it. But there may be one more reason that came to my mind as, as I read this, and it's found in Leviticus 19, 19. For example, uh, maybe a brush if you're there, can you read for us? You shall keep my satyrs. You shall not let your cattle breed with a different kind. You shall not sow your field with two kinds of seeds, nor shall you wear a garment of clothes made of two kinds of material. All right, so here it says, here God is condemning the use of dressing up, of making clothes from two different kinds of materials for the Jews, all right? No such restriction was placed on the pagans, on the, on the Gentiles. I am very sure those are nice looking clothes would have had uh, two or more different materials mixed together. You know, so these people had, I mean, if they had, if they had broken the very first commandment to not have any gods beside the Lord, you know, I mean, this one is uh, one of the many, many, many uh, commandments or civil laws or so that, that were given to them that they were breaking. So uh, again, God identifies this group of people. And in verse nine, uh, he moves on to, he says, everyone who leaps over the threshold and those who fill their master's houses with fraud. All right, so I have another question. I don't know if I, okay. I have another question here. So what, what could be wrong with someone leaping over the threshold? What, what is God onto here? Hello, bro, Peter. Yes. Hello, can yes, you I hear can, me? Yes, I can hear you. When I read that, that day, I, I can't hear you again. I said, when I read the verse on that day, I will, I will punish all who are going to step on the threshold. 
the story that came to my mind was actually when the end the when Dagon fell. Remember the story of Dagon and Dagon fell upon the threshold. You know, when they put the ark of the of the Lord, ark of the covenant in the same temple. And the Bible tells us that since that day they refused to step on that threshold because Dagon had fallen there. So it was like an act of worship to Dagon because it felt that the I see it on the threshold. So God is saying that he will punish all those who refuse to step on the threshold, which means in other words, they were giving allegiance to Dagon or whatever foreign god it was. Yes, yes. Biblically, the most direct reference we have is Dagon, just as you said. It's in 1 Samuel chapter 5. I was going to have someone read it for us, but you've already narrated it very well. Thank you, Sister Tulin. All right, so yes, so, so we see that these guys, they are, they are, there's been a complete shift in their, in their minds, you know, uh, from the service of God to observing even superstitions and practices by the pagans, right? They wouldn't step on their thresholds when probably entering their houses or any building in deference to Dagon, uh, the God of the Philistines, right? And God was seeing this and he's identifying this group of people and saying these people are on my hit list and uh, the day that is coming, you know, they, they, they will not escape it. All right, so we can see that not only were these people worshiping these gods, they were imbibing their culture, their values, their practices, their superstitions, I can't even remember any superstitions of today anymore. I just remember uh, when I was small, maybe there was someone sitting and like like this. Which was that? I don't know. Look at that, like this. Yeah, we used to do that a lot. You know, I used to see that a lot growing up. I don't see that anymore. Maybe if you're sitting and you have a leg stretched out and then somebody walks over, it, hey, no, 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 no. You've taken my destiny or something like that. You know, you have to, you have to cross back and then go around the president. You know, so, huh? There are many superstitions. You see, my mind is so reformed, I can't think of any. <laughs> I'm not sick. Yeah, that's true. Negative confession. You cannot put. You cannot put your hand inside the pot. You have to use something to say, Ah, really? I've not heard that one before. Okay, so so there, there are all kinds of superstitions, and some of them actually have their roots in. Um, in, in false religions, in pagan worship. And here, God is alluding to this. Imagine Israelites leaping over the, over the threshold. All right, so, yeah, what a sight that would have been for the prophets. You know, so, and, and he says, uh, again, in the same breath, those who fill their master's house with, with violence and fraud. Um, what comes to mind here is that, you know, the same way in modern society, anyway, that's the way it's always been, but we, we have it all figured out now, where, uh, if, if un the unemployment rate goes up, the crime rate will naturally go up with it, right? It's, it's just naturally. The two of them, they go hand in hand, okay? In the same way, uh, false religion leads to a change in behavior, all right? The doctrines that we keep being taught in church and from the Bible, they are not for nothing, right? They influence our behavior. They influence our thinking. They influence our minds, all right? In the same way, uh, for example, I think the prophet Nebim was the one who had renounced Nineveh as being the city of blood. All right, that, it was directly tied to their pagan culture, all right, where unlike Israelites who have teachings to love your neighbor as yourself, love the, they, they didn't have all of that, all right? If somebody stepped on their toes, they might have well, as well cut the person's head off, all right? If, uh, uh, just like Israelites had, uh, uh, you, shall, uh, uh, you shall not commit adultery, just think about it in pagan cultures where there was no such uh, divine law. You know, that means if somebody sees somebody else's wife, all he needs to do is take the person out. I think that was what the kind of thing that Abraham himself was afraid of. I think when he went to was it Egypt or Abimelech, one of the two, I, I think, where he was afraid he was going to be killed because his wife was so attractive. All right, so that's what we see in pagan cultures. Pagan cultures, the fruits it breeds you know, uh, can be directly linked to it. And so here, the prophet is renouncing uh, these people who are behaving like this. I mean, they're obviously not being influenced by the word of God. They're being influenced by uh, by the idols that they're serving and filling their houses with violence and fraud. All right. Um, okay, so uh, from verses 10 to 12, it says, on that day, that is the day of the Lord, 
a cry will be heard. A cry will be heard from the fish gates, a wail from the second quarter, a loud crash from the hills. And in verse 11, it says, Wail, O inhabitants of the mortar, for all the traders are no more, all who weigh out silver are cut off. At that time, I will search Jerusalem with lamps. Please excuse me. I will search Jerusalem with lamps, and I will punish the men who are complacent, those who say in their hearts, the Lord will not do good, nor will he do evil. All right, so uh, to walk through this, it says on that day, a cry will be heard from the fish gates, a wail from the second quarter, and a loud crash from the hills. All these three areas described here are in the northern parts of Jerusalem, all right? And this part of Zephaniah's prophecy was again fulfilled literally. Because after the three year siege, a 30 month siege, you know, where the Nebuchadnezzar's army surrounded Jerusalem for three years, where they finally got that breakthrough to get into the city was from the fish gates, was from the north, right? They broke in through the fish gates and entered the second quarter. The second quarter, I forgot which king built it up now, whether Hezekiah, he built it up uh, for people and living and walking around the temple, all right? So a loud crash from the hill. So that's where the Nebuchadnezzar are broken from. And here Zephaniah is foreseeing this and saying uh, these people are going to cry out you know, when this happens. All right. And then in verse 11, he says, well, O inhabitants of the mortar, for all the traders are no more, all who weigh out silver are cut off. Um, the mortar is a valley between the Mount of Olives and Mount Zion, where the temple is. And it's called the mortar because it's shaped like an ancient mortar where they used to where they pounded grain and stuff like a greasy, you know, with their pestle, all right, where they crushed grain in the mortar. And here, Zephaniah is alluding to what is going to happen as the people in that area, you know, they're going to be the ones to get, you know, we used to call it those, the one we used to fight, the first attack, right? <laughs> the people are going, who, are, who are going to get it hot from the Babylonians who have been waiting three years to get into the city. They're going to crush these guys in that area, you know, with their first strength. You know, and, and that area was dominated by traders, right? That was probably their business district where they had a lot of traders trading in, in precious stones, in, in silver, you know. And uh, apparently from other prophets, uh, Zephaniah was also alluding to that that place was infamous for their greed and their, their, their dishonest dealings, right, in their trade. So they're going to get hit first. The army of Nebuchadnezzar is going to come in through there and crush them. All right, and then in verse 12, God says something interesting. He says, at that time, I will search Jerusalem with lamps, and I will punish the men who are complacent. First of all, I will search Jerusalem with lamps. He's indicating that, see, like, you know, the way uh, in Jesus' parable, the Duke, where the woman who lost the coin, you know, searched, swept the entire house carefully, searched every nook and cranny of her home with uh, lamps to find the coin. You know, it's the same imagery here. You know, when you want to be thorough, and leave no stone unturned. God says, see the judgment coming, everybody in Jerusalem is going to get hit. Everybody's going to get hit. All right, and, and really, maybe I should just uh, backtrack a little. I, I, I've read, I don't know from Josephus or some other historian, that this siege was particularly brutal. It lasted for uh, about three years. And the Jews had been deprived, I think after like one, two years, they had been long deprived, they were starving so much that, that people began to eat people. Parents began to kill their little children one by one to eat them just to stay alive. That's how, how, how twisted, how evil, how dark, how gloomy this, this seed was. So, you know, so it was this judgment uh, which Je Jeremiah and Zephaniah and the likes of them you know, were declaring is it's a very, very evil thing. And here, uh, God is saying that it will go around. No one will be able to hide, even especially those men who are complacent. I will search them out. I know Jerusalem had a lot of tunnels, and there's a lot of places to hide underground, even till today. There are a lot of ancient tunnels dating back to the time of Hezekiah. Probably, if you know your way around, you can probably sneak out and find your way outside of the walls, maybe. You know, but God says here that nobody's going to escape. Everybody hiding, whether in their house, under their beds, in the tunnels, in the temple, on the ground, on the, everybody, I'm going to search out and find everybody else, and they're all going to get judged. 
So, and the men who are complacent, those who say in their hearts, the Lord will not do anything, Job. You know, he will not do good, he will not do kill. When he will come on, the Lord will not do anything. You know, so God has heard this uh uh this insulting comment by those who are complacent. I wanted us to read from um Amos, is it Amos 6 1? Um, if you can if you can get there, please read for yes, Amos 6 1, very popular verse. Yes. Woe to them, woe to them that are at ease in Zion. And trust in the mountain of Samaria. So these people are complacent. Uh, other translations say those who are complacent in Zion, they're at ease, they are relaxed, that nothing is going to happen to us. The Lord is not going, He's not going to do jack. You know, uh, it's the same way people like scripture says that like in the last days scoffers will come. People will say, I mean, where is the Jesus? Where is the, where is the Jesus that yeah, you said is going to come? You know, people are complacent, and because, like Ecclesiastes 8 11 says, it says, because the punishment for evil, you know, is delayed because it's taking time, you know, therefore people's hearts are fully set, you know, to pursue evil, to do evil, you know. But God here is promising that that day will come and it will come uh, speedily, and these people who are complacent will not um, escape. In verse 13, uh, it says, their goods shall be plundered. These complacent people, these merchants, these uh, these guys who say God will do nothing, their goods will be plundered. Though they build houses, they shall not inhabit them. Though they plant vineyards, they shall not drink wine from them. Uh, somebody read for us from Deuteronomy chapter 28, verses 30 to 34. And then somebody else read for us from Amos chapter 5, verse 11. Somebody online should read Amos 5, 11. If you're there, please read Deuteronomy 28, verses 30 to 34. Okay, you're on Amos. Okay, read Amos. Amos 5, 11. Yes, read. Therefore, because you trample on the poor and you exact taxes of grain from me, Yes. Okay. So, so this punishment. I wanted someone to read from Deuteronomy 28 because you see that it's something. Mostly, Amos here is, and, and Zechariah are repeating the curse from the law of Moses, where uh, it's as a punishment for sin, as a punishment for defrauded people, as a punishment for dishonesty. God says, the, the money you stole, the wealth you hoarded up. You're not, you, the houses you built, you're not going to live in them. The vineyards you planted, you're not going to drink wine from them. Uh, the money you have in your bank account, somebody else will spend it on your behalf. You know, so uh, here Zephaniah is repeating this curse from the law of Moses. And indeed, this comes to pass. Because uh, what happens in, in those days, rich people were, part, they were, they were special targets. Once an army enters a besieged city, one of the places they raid, of course, where there's something to raid, is the houses of rich people. They'll dig up, scatter their houses, take all their gold and silver, their clothing, whatever is of value, they'll kill them. All right. So, and in verse 14, it says, The great day of the Lord is near. It is near and hastening fast. All right. So, here is, is that same uh, Hebrew way of, uh, of, of emphasizing something by repeating it twice or thrice. So, that day of the Lord is near. Uh, this horrifying day that is being described, you know, is not to, it's not something that is afar off in the future, but it is something that is near, it's right at, at the door. In fact, it says here uh, that the sound of the day of the Lord is bitter. Of course, it's metaphorical, but I, I think recently I understood how sounds, audible sounds can be bitter. And so some, maybe three, four weeks ago, my wife and I woke up to very, one kind of very fearful, deadly screeching sound. And we heard people running and screaming, and there was commotion in our streets. We quickly jumped up, opened our window, and right from our window, we could see like three or four blocks away, there's a very big ball of flame, you know, and we immediately knew what was happening. There's a filling station there that they built in the middle of res uh, residential uh, houses, right? We had talked and thought, but you know, they even blocked it off initially. The Lagos State government, where apparently they went to settle them and they came and removed their, 
locate and remove their X that the marks, marks to place. And they started operating. So a tanker was on fire that day. I, I don't think I've seen a larger ball of flame in my life than that. It was so tall, so big. It was bigger than a two-story building right beside it. My goodness. You know, so, and the sound that the fire was making, I'm, I'm normally a brave person, but man, my heart melted. <laughs> The very sound of the fire, you know. So, of course, we had to close all our windows, curtains, everything, and, and, and try to stay away from it as possible. I was afraid to go out because I'd heard uh, the story of the gas explosion and how that people within the building were safe, but people outside were hit directly by the blast. You know, so, thank God that um, uh, it turned out to be a kerosene tanker, not petrol. And, and the fire service came just before we left for work and we were able to put it out. All right, so, so trust me, sounds. Sounds can be bitter, all right? <laughs> you know, so here is Zephaniah, he's describing how, how twisted, how, how uh, horrible that day is going to be. And then he says something else that I find interesting. He says, the mighty man cries aloud there. You know, wh what is he saying there? You see, mighty men, they are the last you expect to cry about anything, right? Um, um, you think about it. I, I, I've heard stories from people I, I wasn't there so i don't know you know but from people that i know wouldn't make up stuff and in fact on tv actually a, a former army captain came to decry the situation where um boko haram attacked a town where there were soldiers i think somewhere in bono state there were soldiers there even the special forces uh, a group of special forces guys and the special forces mean that they are not ordinary soldiers there's something extra right you know so and but for some reason Boko Haram, they came in such overwhelming numbers with such uh, massive weaponry and ammunition that these guys dropped their guns and ran. Okay, imagine the site as a civilian. You're walking towards that place and you see special forces soldiers and Mopo running. You know, they. <laughs> what will come to your heart? <laughs> you, you know, so that's the picture that Zephaniah is painting. He said, that day, it will be so horrible, so horrifying, so terrible that the strongest men, their, their resolve, their confidence, their strength will be, will be evaporated and they will cry like babies. They will be broken down at what they see and hear. All right, so and then he goes on to tell us that see, this day of the Lord is not a day of fair weather, it's not a day of clear skies, it's not a day to go take a walk in the park, it's a day of wrath, a day of distress, a day of anguish, a day of ruin and devastation, a day of darkness and gloom, a day of clouds and thick darkness, a day of trumpet blasts and battle cry against the fortified cities and against the lofty battlements. You know, those of us that did not live during the civil war, we're really blessed though. You know, I've met people who lived through it, our parents' age, and they tell you, you could just be, even in supposedly safe zones like Lagos, you just be walking on the road and you just hear this alarm, this very loud alarm. And you know what? Go find shelter because within minutes, They'll start bombing, you know, maybe planes passing, they start dropping, and there's no telling where the bombs might hit. You know, so it wasn't, there was no stability, there was no confidence living life normally. You know, there was fear, there was tension in the air. And Zephaniah is telling us, you know, the trumpet blast in those days, uh, they used to have sentries posted on the walls at different points on the walls where if, uh, uh, a, 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 an enemy army was approaching, these guys would take up their bugle, their trumpet, and, and sound it. It's something like this that I think in First Corinthians 14 that Paul was talking about when he says, if, if, the, if the bugle is not sounded, if, if it doesn't have distinguishing sounds, how will you know which one is a lamb and which one is ceremonial? All right, so that was the five that they were seeing on the rise in those days. So Zephaniah here in verse 15 paints the picture for us that this is not a day human is picking to look forward to. It is the day of God's wrath. It's the day of darkness and bitterness and anguish and darkness and gloom and death. In verse 17, uh, Zephaniah comes back, having uh, started out by telling us of the Lord's judgment that is to come upon the whole world, and then focusing on Judah, he again zooms out and tells us or reminds us that this judgment 
uh, uh, that the Lord's, on the Lord's day, that God is going to visit his judgment on the whole world. Of course, scholars, uh, they understand Zephaniah, uh, Zephaniah's prophecy as being dual, being that it already has its first uh, fulfillment to Judah uh, when Nebuchadnezzar attacked and conquered them, but it will have a broader uh, global uh, fulfillment uh, in a day that is yet future. All right, so here God says, I will bring distress on mankind so that they shall walk like the blind because they have sinned against the Lord. Their blood shall be poured out like dust and their flesh like dung. Just uh, recently, my wife and I, we, we saw a movie where uh, one of these apocalyptic movies where the end of the world, this one was about a comet, you know, like the one that scientists said hit millions of years ago and took out all the dinosaurs. Uh, you know, uh, uh, led to the extinction of the dinosaurs. You know, it's a comet bigger than that. The comets will hit Earth somewhere between North Africa and Europe. And of course, the, <laughs> the prognosis was semen. You have a bunker that can last for several months, go and hide. You know, the US government had a, they, they were organized, you know, like Nigeria. They had a plan where they picked people by profession doctors, nurses, uh, engineers, electricians, computer scientists, people by their profession. Just a, a tiny amount of people because there's not enough space for for many people and, and and took them to greenland you know and kept them in bunkers there for like almost a year you know, and, and they were able to live through that um, catastrophe and so when they, even before the comet hit the tiny fragments of the comet that were hitting you know tiny fragments of one of them took out you know uh, was enough to take out cities cities with millions of people like one what at one go millions of people dead you know, so that's the picture Zephaniah is painting here, that it will be thorough, it will be global, and here God is promising that will bring distress, you know, on mankind. Jesus said something, he said that there has never been such a time like this, and after it, there will never be anything like it. All right, it's going to be one of a kind, it's going to be God pouring out the dregs of his wrath, of his judgment on this world. And Zephaniah here, if in case you missed it earlier, he makes it easy for us. He says, because they have sinned against the Lord. God is doing this not because he's having a bad day and he's looking for who to take it out on, but because we have sinned and we've had it coming. All right. Having given us centuries, not centuries, millennia, you know, of time to repent. He sent prophet after prophet. He sent his son. He sent apostles. He's had the church on earth here witnessing. And yet, the world is still the way it is. And here, it's, it's really gory, but you have to read it out. It says, their blood shall be poured out like dust, all right? Their, their flesh like dung. They're not going to die normal. They're not going to die good deaths. They're going to die horrible, terrifying deaths. Their bodies practically desecrated, all right? These are very hefty, hefty things uh, that the prophet is putting down here. And then he says something else in verse 18. He says, neither their silver nor their gold shall be able to deliver them on the day of the wrath of the Lord. In the fire of his jealousy, all the earth, not some, all the earth shall be consumed for a full and sudden end he will make of all the inhabitants of the earth. Of all the inhabitants of the earth. A full and sudden end. And that confirmed, uh, it, uh, it confirms with everything else Jesus and all the other prophets said. And it's going to be sudden. Nobody, you know, forget all these movies where the U.S. government had a plan. There will be no plan. Nothing could have prepared any nation or anybody, an individual or any family, any community, any continent for what is coming. Nothing. No precedence. There will be no, you know, the way uh, you see in movies, you know, I really like it. But you see movies that maybe in times of, uh, of calamity, of terrorist attacks in the White House, what of those movies, they, uh, you know, the U.S. president has a bunker, <laughs> you know, it, uh, some kilometers on the ground, and he has dedicated a dedicated train network that can take him out of Washington, you know, to different parts of the U.S. or different parts of the world, I don't know. There will be no bunker deep enough to save anybody from this. There will be no bulletproof. There will be, you know, and, and this also um, reminds me of, of something. You know how the rich they trust in their wealth. Uh, some many centuries ago, in what is now Turkey, the city of Constantinople, I think it was the last Christian stand you know, that the Romans had before uh, this guy, the Sultan uh, Mehmet, conquered Constantinople. You know, so 
the siege lasted a very long time. I don't remember it was for years, but it was a very long time. And he couldn't conquer the city. And they held, they kept waiting for an army from uh from other Christian nations to come and help them you know, against this Muslim army. But the help never came to so they never came. You know, so and the Christian guy, the last Caesar, you know, he was like he had spent everything in the in the, the city's treasury, paying the soldiers, he got brought in uh, mercenaries from Genoa, and they were able to hold uh, the, the Muslim army for a long time. You know, but and then there was this guy, a member of his court. Everybody else had contributed what they could, I mean, to save their lives. There was this guy from uh, in the King's Court, right there in front of him, that was the richest guy, it was like a Django Day. You know, the kind of person that, you know, can, you know, if even half of his wealth would have been enough to get more mercenaries, more soldiers to defend their city. But you know what, the guy chose not to give it to their king because he felt that, ah, that this is a lost cause. Now, even if I give all the money, to to our king and then we save the city what next who's going to pay me back my money i know what he said i'll keep it i'll use some of it to bribe the sultan many ways so that i can spare me i can continue doing my business they know me in this kingdom it's cheap of stars you know that kind of thing that's his thinking and truly truly uh the the muslim army overran constantinople and took it over i think that's how they uh, we got turkey on european soil a muslim country all right so and yeah, it's Istanbul now. It's called Istanbul now. All right. So, and when the the Sultan was interviewing uh, some of the survivors, and then he talks to this guy, he says, "I know you, ha, ha. you know." And then the guy brings lots of gold and stuff and say, "I'll give it to you. Just spare my life, me and my family, and uh, let us live peacefully. I do business. I will help the economy. This kind of thing." You know, the Sultan is a Muslim guy, but he's reasonable enough to look at him in disgust and say, "Ha." ha what kind of twisted person are you that you had this much money if you had given this money to your king that i wouldn't be sitting on his throne now that the guy would have been able to pay his soldiers motivate them get more mercenaries i mean that you must be a very wicked person i cannot have somebody like you anywhere near me please take all this money but cut his head off you know so the guy having hoped on his wealth to save him it turns out to be the very thing that hangs him and here god is saying uh there isn't going to be any rich person who has escaped this. No amount of money is going to be enough to shelter anybody. It's going to come for the rich, the poor, everybody, white, black, everybody says a fool, a complete and sudden end will he make of all the inhabitants of the earth. And just to remind us that why is all this happening? If I ask that question, I'm sure you'd say to me that, like Zephaniah said in a nutshell, that because we've sinned against the Lord, right? Because we've sinned, the, ah, hallelujah. Because we've sinned against the Lord. But if you break it down, if you break it down, something like this. Because that because we failed to heed God's commandments, God's commandments are, we shall not commit adultery, right? We shall not lie. We shall not take what is not yours. In fact, you shall not forget what is not yours in your heart. You shall not deal dishonestly. You know, all those things that we think are small things. You know, we look at these things and we look at them as so small. And we look at the calamity you know, we can't see the connection like this can overkill God. Uh, is it be just because of these small things we do? Is that why you know? But this is how seriously God views sin. This is how serious sin is. You know, there are no white lies only lies and this is the just repayment for all our sins for all our like what Willie said not loving our neighbors as ourselves of us esteeming ourselves uh, more than others right of us not loving the lord our god with all of us of us not following the lord our god fully all right that is sinful all right it's it's patronizing to be serving god while at the same time your affections are elsewhere or some of your affections are elsewhere you know, so that's the real reason why this must happen. That's the reason why this must happen. And um, so I have a question here that how does this affect how we live? Knowing that this sort of, uh, of judgment or this kind of widespread destruction, and you know from scripture uh, that God is absolutely capable of something like this, right? He's done stuff like this before, right? He's done something like this to major cities in their day, Sodom and Gomorrah. He wiped them out clean. Right? Whether it was a meteor shower, whether it was comets, whatever it is he used to rain down fire on them, he wiped them off. It's something like what is coming. 
you know, and um, uh, which one again? Noah, in the time of Noah, he used water, he wiped out everybody, save eight people, just eight people, wiped out everybody. So we know that this threat is not an empty threat. It's something that will happen. And according to scripture, it is near, it is right at the door. So what does this mean for us? So I'd like us to read some scriptures in closing, um, chief of which is First Peter chapter 3, verses 7 to 13. Somebody else who hasn't read online, somebody online, please read for us. First Peter chapter 3, verses 7 to 13. And then somebody else read for us from Matthew 24, verse 42. And also from Matthew 25. Somebody else? From Matthew 14. Who is that? Matt, um, first Peter 3, first Peter verse 3. 7. Okay. okay, let Thomas read first Peter. Thomas, go ahead. 7 to 13, right? Yes. Okay. Husbands, in the same way, treat your wives with consideration as a weaker partners and show them honor as fellow heirs of the grace of life. In this way, nothing will hinder your prayers. Finally, all of you, finally, all of you be harmonious, sympathetic, affectionate, compassionate, and humble. Do not return evil for evil or insults or insult for insult, but instead bless others because you were called to inherit blessing. For the one who wants to love life and see good days must keep his tongue from evil and his lips from uttering the seeds. And he must turn away from evil and do good. He must seek peace and pursue it. For the right. eyes of the Lord are upon the righteous. Yeah. Huh? First Peter 3, I mean, I'm verse 12 now. Okay. For the eyes of the Lord are upon the righteous and his ears are upon right, and are open to the uh, prayer. Second Peter, I mean, I've gotten the reference wrong. The second Peter, right? Yeah. Okay. Sorry, Thomas, please read Second Peter 3, 7 to 12. Okay. But, but by the same word, the present heavens and earth have been reserved for fire by being kept for the day of judgment and destruction of the ungodly. Now, dear friends, do not let this one thing escape your, your notice, that a single day is like a thousand years with the Lord, and a thousand years are like a single day. The Lord is not slow concerning his promise, as some regards slowness, but as some regards slowness, but is being patient towards you, because he does not wish for anyone, for any to perish, but for all to come to repentance. But the day of the Lord will come like a thief. When it comes, the heavens will disappear with a horrific noise, and the celestial bodies will melt away in place, and the earth and every deed done on it will be laid bare. Since all these things are to melt away in this manner, what sort of people must we be conducting our lives in holiness and godliness while we're waiting for and hastening the coming of the, the um, coming of the day of God? Because, because of this day, the heavens will be burned up and dissolved, and the celestial bodies will melt away in blaze. But according to, the, to his promise, we are waiting for new heavens and the new earth in which righteousness truly resides. Okay. Yeah, thank you. So, so very quickly, before uh, the others read from Matthew 24 and Matthew 25, I just want to say that yeah, Peter is telling us that because these things are going to happen, that we should live holy lives. It's, it's a reason, it's a motivation for us to live holy lives. And uh, I'll give you my um, one angle to it. There are others. Um, I, I, I personally view sin as being too expensive. You know, the way I go to I go to, I, I drive past um, the cash shop when they're selling taxi and, and all those things. My mind doesn't even go there. I can't, I can't even afford to be lost in after it. It doesn't make any sense. In the same way, the price for sin, all right, is, is too great and no man can pay it. All right, so I, I marvel when I see people, you know, Sin with levity, talk about sin with levity as though it's normal, as though it's something we cannot do without. It is too expensive. It is far too expensive, even for the whole world. 
all right? And, and so here, Peter tells us that this is motivation because we know that everything is going to pass away. It's going to be destroyed like this. We cannot set our hearts on them. Rather, it should motivate us to pursue holiness and obedience to God. Even as we wait, sorry, as we wait and look forward to the new heavens, the new heavens and the new earth that God has promised. Because this is not the end, by the way. Even though this is written in Isaiah chapter 1 ends. All right, so somebody else read for us from Matthew 24 or Matthew 25. Matthew 24 okay, verse... Matthew, Matthew 24, 24. Um, 42. Yes. Therefore, be on alert, for you do not know which day your Lord is coming. Matthew right. 24, 42. That's it. All right, so here I wanted to pick out that uh, scripture says to, for us to be on alert, to live ready, all right, uh, like John Piper once says, to have a wartime mentality, never be attached to. You should be ready to just pick up just what you need and move. All right? Leave your television behind, leave your fancy clothes behind, leave your car behind, uh, leave all your fancy stuff, all your earthly stuff behind, only what you need. Yeah, and, and, um, and, and, I think, and I think John Piper's view is, is really spot on because uh, we are in a wartime. All right, we are in war time. What we've talked about today, what Zephaniah has talked about, we've read from Zephaniah, is the culmination of what is already going on. It's the culmination of it, it's the finale, the grand finale of it. All right, so, and we must live ready because we do not know. The time. In fact, I think that's the whole point of God not telling us the time in the Bible, all right, so that we can live ready. All right, so uh, who's reading for us from Matthew 25 13? Yes, Therefore, keep watch. Yes, go ahead. Evelyn. Matthew 25. Uh, sorry, Evelyn, go okay, ahead. 14. Sorry, sorry. Let Sister Evelyn read. Matthew 25, verse 13. Therefore, keep watch, because you do not know the day or the hour. All right. So, keep watch, because you do not know the day or the hour. It's re repeating what he says in Matthew 24. Keep watch. You know, do not get carried away by this world's cares and, and, and the many stresses. Keep watch because you do not know the day. This is how serious this is. This is how devastating it's going to be. You do not want to be caught on our That's why God has told us this. That's why we are here today. That's why we come to church every week so that we do not forget, so that we do not get carried away by, by, by uh, our earthly lives and our, our responsibilities and our routines and forget that... God is about to hit the hard reset button, you know, any day. It could be any day, it could be any time. The alarm will go off. Amen. So any questions or comments? I, I want to say that the day of the Lord, which is, this is the type and shadow yes. of the day of the Lord. It's a terrifying thing, but the reason why God warns us about it is so that it does not happen to us. So God is scaring us. Yes, so I don't get close. So, you know, yes, so because we, many of many times, we turn up, just like your teacher warning you, a better read for that exam, whatever you say, or you say, this doesn't mean anything. You, know, you, want, you don't want to get angry, and you don't plan, or like the parents are going up, warning you. You need to take your life seriously. You always said you part this area, mm -hmm. but you know that is for your our own benefit. So may we really be all the one in the future. I don't know if we heard uh the King Wally. You didn't hear him. Okay. Um I should summarize. Okay. All right. Didn't uh, him. You didn't hear him. Okay. Uh basically said that the reason why God has put these kinds of warnings for us in the Bible is so that we don't get caught in it, all right? It's so that we can escape it, all right? Uh, he gave the example of, uh, you know, when you're in school and your teacher is telling you, you are better read so that you don't fail this upcoming exam. It's not because the teacher wants you to fail. It's because he doesn't want you to fail, all right? You have to experience the failure. So this warning is not just to scare us out of our minds, but to make sure that we don't get caught because it is coming, all right? So that we don't get caught, uh, we don't get 
wiped out with the people, uh, like scripture says, with those says with those who are perishing, but that we live ready and 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 escape these things that are to come upon the whole world. Amen. Any other comments, questions? I think in addition to what um, Deacon Wale said, I think that's Deacon Wale that spoke. I don't know, but um, in addition to what he said. Um, I think that's also like a symbol of God's love that he would actually also put that in the Bible. You know, like, I don't want you guys to get caught up in this judgment that is impending. So I think it's also a symbol of his love for us. All right. So I, I, I well, I have a comment myself. Thank you, Sister Evelyn. I have a comment myself. I just remembered a quote from uh, this Scottish preacher, uh, Robert Murray McShane. Um, he said, uh, he, I'm, I'm trying to paraphrase it, he who must tell others about hell must do so with tears in his eyes, all right? If you're gonna tell people about hell, if you're gonna preach about hell, you should do so with tears in your eyes, knowing what you're talking about and how serious and how devastating this is gonna be if this person does not um, listen to you, if this person does not obey the gospel. You know, so I, I, I think that warnings like this, they're not just for us, uh, uh, to take heed to uh, for, for our own persons, but also for us to inspire us in our evangelism, in our efforts to evangelize people, in our efforts to uh, speak to our brothers, speak to our sisters, speak to our friends. You know, you one big reason, and I think it's one big regret we're all going to have after the Lord comes, is that we did not warn people enough. We did not warn people enough. We were too shy of not wanting to offend people. We were ashamed. We didn't want to cross any lines. We didn't want to, we were scared of losing our relationships with the person. We were afraid to offend the person by telling them, see, if you continue the way you're going, you're going to end up in hell, right? Um, I've had to do that. I, I, I struggle with that as well, but I've had to do it a couple of times and it wasn't pleasant, you know. I, I almost practically fell sick after, you know, because there were people I really cared about, people I really loved and respected, and I looked them in the eye and said, see, you're going to hell, if you do not repent of your sins. This sin you're doing and smiling is evil in the sight of God. And this is what God does with people like this. You know, I've, I, you know so I, I want to encourage us, especially people close to us, our brothers, our sisters, our cousins, our friends, our moms, our dads. You never can tell. You might just be the only person who ever tells it to them the way you are going to do, uh, the way you are going to do it. So let's not be shy. Let's rather risk our relationship with them, you know, than to allow for them to continue in the way that they're going, because this is what's, uh, what is ahead. And you know, like scripture says, we didn't get to that part. You know, God is worshiped and God is righteous to judge people this way. God is righteous to wipe out everybody and send them all to hell this way. God is righteous in doing that, right? So the only thing is for us to avoid this judgment you know, before it happens. Right. So any other comments, any other questions? Any other comments or questions? I think I skipped something in verse 9. I think I thought I was going to come back to it later. Verse 9 and thereabouts, where it talks about uh, the sacrifice and the guests. You know, so there's a final was using figurative speech to mean that the sacrifice is the Jews themselves. They are the meat on the table. They are the rice and stew on the table. And the guests are the Babylonians, you know. God was going to call the Babylonians to come and slaughter them and pour their blood out like dust and desecrate their bodies in their own Jerusalem. You know, and and um, if some of us have read the book of Habakkuk before, you see there's a strange book where the prophet is not speaking to the people like Zephaniah and all the other prophets are doing. He's speaking to God like, but why, why would you allow this kind of thing to happen? It's one of the the uh, lamentations it takes to God. Why would you allow Babylon of all people to be the ones to come and conquer your people? These disgusting people, but uh, that is God's judgment. You know, it's not pretty, it's not dignifying, it's going to be as as horrible and and, and twisted as, uh, you know, as can be imagined and more. All right, so uh, in the absence of any questions or comments, I think we should take our hymn and close. Uh, Sister Evelyn, I see you. Please pray for us after we sing. All right, so uh, the hymn is from uh, singing hymn 373. No, no, no. Sorry, sorry, Brother Peter, the other Sister Evelyn or. 
No, you, you, you. Oh, okay. So the hymn I want us to sing is, I, I got the reference wrong. I know not why God's wondrous grace. If you know where it is, please. So let me stop recording. Um,